For me, I remember just feeling like I couldn't quite find contemporary Tibetan artists that did exactly the style of work I wanted to. But that, um, what it felt more like was mainstream uh, art done by Tibetan artists seemed more to have the flavor of a political aspect, more uh, pertaining to this idea of uh, country being lost and, you know, I guess more in the realm of uh, being a victim. And there's power in that representation, but I don't quite think that's fully my story to tell, you know, because in a lot of ways, Tibet's uh, uh, displacement, I am very fortunate in my upbringing of freedom in America, you know, so I can't lie and pretend like I've been oppressed or I can't study my language, because that's not true. You know, I have this greater uh, freedom and I am lucky for that. But what I am seeing with uh, new young Tibetan artists, which I love, is it's more uh, the celebration of uh, Tibetan culture and it's like, uh, iconography you know it's not very much oh pity me this happened uh, but I really love this sense of um, well we have a rich history and, and you know like well, we're, we, we're gonna celebrate it you know we're gonna claim our spots at the table rather than get others to basically uh, speak for us. That was Sultim Tenzin a representational painter currently based in New York. He was born in Nepal raised there until he immigrated to the United States while still quite young. In our interview, he described his experience living with his mixture of identities, identities that were born both of his ethnic roots and of his attempts to acclimate to his surroundings. I came to uh, the States when I was about seven years old. And uh, yeah, so I, I guess I, I've kind of had uh, similarities with a lot of people in my generation in the sense where you get this mixture of uh, this American identity a little bit, but also this roots where it's like when you're at home, it's you're Tibetan, you're supposed to express the utmost Tibetanness. But when you're outside in the world, like for example, me being in America, it's not a lot of people even know what being Tibetan is or let alone parts of the culture, you know? So it's very much juggling with this two identity and just trying to figure out um, where my place is. When asked about how his profession as an artist influences his life outside of the studio, Tenzin emphasized a connection between the two worlds. In his work, we can see his specific focus on observing the present reality. His overall body of work can almost be seen as a collection of his observations put to canvas, the products of his hunger for more knowledge and of his tendency towards compassion. This role of observer, if you will, then relates back to how he is in his everyday life how he connects with people and is constantly in a state of learning and discovery. You know, for me, what seems like a meaningful life is just one where I'm constantly learning, being better, as well as growing through time to be excellent at what I do, right? So how that, uh, my identity comes in is more just this Tibetan side as well as this American side where I don't quite feel like, um, a sense of being biased, you know, where I'm going to treat Tibetans a little better, or just like uh, Tibetans are more kind than Americans. I try not to have that kind of rhetoric and uh, thought process, but just that I'd like to live in a world where we're all equal, treat each other fairly. You know, that seems more like uh, the honest or just more a better world for me. Being the first artist in his family, Tenzin describes a path that eventually led him to a life in the arts. Rather than there being one defining moment, he credits his never-ending curiosity that followed him throughout his childhood. A curiosity that didn't die down with age, but rather grew alongside him. I was coming around when uh, technology was very much growing. So I, had, I was into, let's say, digital art and... Uh, I had some interest there, but I just remember that actual practice of physically drawing on paper or painting on canvas just felt a little bit more uh, enjoyable for me. There's a strong emphasis situated on the realness and the physicality of his subjects that, by extension, pays special attention to how layers of color can imitate real flesh and bone. These fine and delicate details present in the works of master artists such as Rembrandt and Peter Paul Rubens are what enticed and inspired him to pursue representational art in the first place. And I just remember what resonated most with me was uh, art before 
19th century or maybe early 19th century to before. Whereas not that I don't like modernism or just the uh, abstract art, but it's more that uh, older style of art kind of uh, resonated with me because it was kind of like a person can do that, like create uh, a beautiful portrait like Rembrandt. And it just amazed me um, how amazing uh, in terms of talent a human can possess. It just felt uh, like it was magic in a sense. You know, so that's how I really got into representational art, trying to uncover this language. This language of observational art, Tenzin explains, symbolizes his detachment from today's highly digitalized culture, instead turning his focus to the present reality, to what is tangible and engaging, as well as connecting with a past that existed before our ever-present technology. This allows him to further appreciate the fruits of his manual labor, which in today's reality seems amiss. But a connection with the past is not the only thing Tenzin seeks. He also values the collaborative bond he builds with his subjects, a link that deepens the meaning of the work. Tenzin takes his subjects beyond that role, pursuing a collaborative alliance. Such was the case with his work Solem, which not only introduces his Tibetan background into his art, but also incorporates elements of the sitter, Rene. Uh, Solem I did... Uh... I think beginning of 2019. And um, what I began doing was adorning, uh, adorning uh, Westerners with Tibetan chuas, you know? So it was a sense of just dispersing uh, Tibetan culture in a way, right? And um, I think Renee was going through some uh, issues during that time with, I guess, her relationship. So in a way it kind of worked into uh, this uh, solemn or uh, this state of mind or emotion that I kind of wanted to convey. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that, that, that kind of was what started the painting was just being able to express this weird state where you're not joyous nor fully upset, but more just a little bit dignified and a little bit more composed and emotionless, right? right. And, and then I, I remember that was the pose. You know, wow. it was when the cats got on, on the chair and she leaned over and then I was like, do this, you know? <laughs> and uh, and this is where kind of like we spoke on and touched on earlier about you get to know the person a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rene is a big fan of Caravaggio. You know, uh, and we, when we think of Caravaggio's painting, we think of uh, strong light and dark chiaroscuro. Right. Right? So that painting, um, the background wasn't the way it was, this very dark, uh, and um, background where it has that light effect. Mm -hmm. uh, I incorporated later on knowing that, uh, thinking about Renee in terms of her fascination with uh, Caravaggio. Better Days, on the other hand, is a more explicit exploration of his Tibetan identity. Uh, in terms of what inspired that piece, I remember when I was a student, uh, other uh, peers of mine, they were telling me there's a Tibetan art model. I was like, I was super excited because that's like uncommon, you know, finding a Tibetan art model. And I found out that it was uh, Tsitting, who is the model for Better Days. So that painting happened when I left school. I was like, I got to get this guy. And um, he just finished modeling as in like, uh, he was retired, but he was so excited to have a Tibetan artist reach out to him. And uh, as that painting progressed, I got to know Tsitting a little bit more and uh, in some sense, uh, you know, I learned more, uh, a little bit more about his life, and I won't disclose all of it, of course, but it was more a uh, manifestation of just, uh, I think as Tibetans, you have Tibetans coming uh, in the diaspora with their own set of skills, right. maybe, and when they come to America or westernized world, that skill isn't necessarily not uh, embraced. They aren't able to quite uh, have that same job that they might have had back home through the struggle you know you still have optimism having better days are yet to come uh in the sense of how the landscape was treated with the clouds and just uh it's starting to break away from the distance yeah. and uh, the way he posed was kind of my uh idea of tibetan men and chua i remember as a kid you always see them hand in that pocket and hand in the pocket and i don't know what they're grabbing onto maybe it's because it's cold or also uh in that pouch they put you know items wallets you know gets in there and hands to his chest just more embracing his dignified uh, stance. 
We ask Tenzin about his favorite part of the creative process, and he describes a feeling we are all too familiar with, one of overwhelmed self-criticism upon starting new projects. It always feels nice when you start a project, you're always excited, there's yeah. like a, a lot of momentum going in, but once you're in the middle of it or towards the end, you're like, oh my god, I am terrible. You feel, it's, I'm very, uh, I guess, just very self-deprecating, where mm -hmm. I'm just like, what was I thinking? But you just kind of have to push forward and just finish it, move on to the next one. Yes. And then five months later, and then you look back at that previous thing, you're like, okay, maybe I was too hard on myself. You know, it's not perfect, but it wasn't uh, exactly the bad feelings I had in the moment, you know. But I guess my favorite process is uh, the part of just gathering uh, uh, the objects or learning a little bit of the story. You know, I like going to thrift stores and buying different fabrics. Like I enjoy that part of it where I'm just like creating the world, you know, setting up the world. Tenzin also has a message for the youth. I wish I could give a more personalized uh, answer, but I guess uh, I might veer towards the typical cliche. But uh, I guess for for Tibetans youth, I think what's tough is like we've mentioned, it's there's this familial aspect of um, roadblock, you know, and also young Tibetans. I know what's tough to juggle is there's this duty to family, mm -hmm. right? Where you can't quite focus on uh, your craft or uh, your goals because you also have to take care of your parents right. at the same time. Whereas I don't think uh, a lot of Westerners quite have that. You know, the parents are like, you know, we can take care of ourselves, you do you. Right. There is a lack of freedom and time, but I think um, with that, never adopt uh, a mentality of um, being a victim, like boohoo, like, this is my circumstance. I don't have connections. I don't have mm -hmm. the skill. I, I think just being uh, having faith in yourself that you are worth it and that you do have the capabilities of doing great things. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say, uh, you know, reflect and act based on actions rather than words. Just remember that it's not a sprint. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's a marathon. It takes time. The most important part is having that uh, system and environment around you that will, that is constantly there. And then hopefully the individual has you know, a moment where it's like, I can't let them down. You know, like I have to, you know, I'm starting to believe in myself now because I don't want to let all these people down who never give, given up on me. Mm -hmm. So I think what I love about what you guys are doing, like with the Apple Collective and what I'm seeing with these other Tibetan groups is it, it kind of caters to uh, having that environment, right? Where it's like, um, maybe uh, I understand where you're coming from, from your familiar background, but hey, you know, like I got your back and, you know, it's like this group where I feel like you guys are creating an environment that's embracing each other. And I think that's important. So that's, the, uh, you know, one person doesn't become successful. It's a community right. that uh, helps each other out. That's the truth.